Hi, welcome back. My name is Amy Fassler, and I'm an APES teacher at Marshfield High School in Marshfield, Wisconsin. Kind of up in the northern latitudes near Lake Superior, fun fact, by surface area, Lake Superior contains 10% of the world's freshwater resources. That's just a huge amount of water and a beautiful ecosystem if you ever get a chance to visit. Let's take a look at what we're going to learn today. In AP Daily Live Video 6, we will review the differences between renewable and non-renewable energy resources, describe how energy is generated from all kinds of different fuel sources from renewable to non-renewable, really focus a lot on the advantages, disadvantages, and unintended consequences of different energy solutions, and finally, our favorite, review some sample multiple choice and practice free response questions that highlight setting up and calculating energy conversion problems. Let's start with a big little review of renewable and non-renewable energy resources. This video is all about unit six in our studies, looking at energy resources and consumption. Let's start with what describes describing what makes a resource renewable or non-renewable. Remember, we want to list characteristics here, and I'm going to share with you some really strong vocabulary that could quickly and easily help you describe the differences. Renewable resources can be replenished by natural processes. That's like they can be restocked. Um, Non-renewable resources cannot be replenished. The processes that made those took so long, it's measured on the geologic time scale, that on a human time scale, we're not going to get those replenished. Renewable resources can continually regenerate themselves. Trees can regrow. Non-renewable resources are present in a fixed amount. Once we use them up, they're gone. And examples of renewable resources are things like biomass, solar, wind, and geothermal. The non-renewable resources include all the fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas. Re renewable resources cannot be reused. Uh-oh, non-renewable resources can't be reused either. What's up with that? Let's take a look at the difference between the terms replenish versus reusing. Here's a bunch of firewood all stacked up, ready for me to burn, um, to use to charcoal, as charcoal to cook my food, or in some developing countries, biomass is a major source of energy. They use it for fuel for cooking or for heating. Once I burn that firewood, I can't reuse it but I can replenish it, I can restock it or grow more trees. So again, really, really kind of focusing on strong vocabulary to help me distinguish the difference. Another big concept in this unit is looking at energy uh, distribution and consumption on a global scale. The global distribution or how those energy resources are dispersed across our planet isn't even, and it depends on an Earth's geologic history. We sort of have some regions that, that are the energy winners and some that are the energy losers. Developed countries tend to use energy at a much greater rate than less developed countries. Think about the demographic transition model from our study of human population and what happens as a country becomes industrialized. Their energy resource demand goes up substantially. The availability, the price, those things go hand in hand, and government policies influence which type of energy people use and how much of it they use. Let's see if we can look at this diagram that shows world energy consumption by source over the last few decades. Notice that the unit is measured in quadrillion British thermal units. There's a lot of different units that we might see in energy um, concepts. And let, don't let those units distract you. You don't have to know a lot about all those different units. If you would ever have to convert from one energy unit to another, that conversion factor would be given to you. So it's a heat unit, a BTU or a British thermal unit. And what I really just want to focus on here is trends over time. So generally, I can see that natural gas use has increased globally and is projected to keep increasing. Coal use has started to dip a little bit bet. That's based on availability and price. And nuclear seems like kind of a flat line. Let's dig a little bit deeper into coal and natural gas, two of those fossil fuels that we looked at the trends on that previous graph. 
Let's look at the pros and cons. That's a big focus that we want as we compare why we might use one energy source versus another. Coal is very plentiful, it's cheap, it's easy to extract, transport, and convert into electricity. Most countries have some amount of coal, although countries like the US and China and Russia have really big deposits. We've been using coal for hundreds of years and there's hundreds more years of coal in the ground. Um, it's super easy to get that coal out of the ground. Um, I can blow the top off a mountain. I can use long wall mining. But the disadvantages of coal really extend through all parts of the energy cycle, starting with the mining of it. If I blow the top off the mountain, I can easily get at the coal, but there's a lot of habitat destruction. Burning that coal to generate electricity creates carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas, SOX gases, remember those um, can react to form acid rain. We'll look at that in another lecture. And heavy metals like mercury that are neurotoxins. Finally, at the end of burning that coal, I have hazardous waste disposal because of the massive amounts of coal ash that remain. Natural gas relative to coal is a much is still an abundant source and we're finding that we can access lots more resources, especially domestically. It's cleaner burning than coal. There's still carbon dioxide. It's still a hydrocarbon that I'm burning, but it doesn't have a lot of those other mercury and sulfur impurities that coal has. The disadvantages of natural gas is the way that we get that natural gas out of the rock, the shale that it's locked in. And we use a process called hydraulic fracturing or fracking to split up that rock and free those methane gas molecules so we can capture them. And the process of fracking can contaminate groundwater because they pump down to fracture the rock chemicals and water. They also use um, sand sometimes. We do a little bit of frac sand mining in Wisconsin. Let's take a look at some of the um, ways that electricity is generated from coal and natural gas. The basic process is the same. This is schematic is showing coal, but the, the mantra that we want to um, learn about the way that electricity is generated from hydrocarbon combustion is pretty much all the same. I start by burning the fuel. And we should recognize this sort of basic reaction for hydrocarbon combustion. I always form carbon dioxide and water, uh, both of which are greenhouse gases. Um, in the combustion of that fuel, I heat water. So I put the coal in there, I train, I truck it um, from where I've extracted it to the coal-fired power plant. I tip that train car over and I burn it. It's pretty easy. And in the process of burning that coal, I heat water that makes steam. The steam turns a turbine. The turbine powers a generator and that electricity is pushed out onto the grid through transmission lines. Notice the big cooling tower in the diagram. There's water. Um, power plants are always located near a natural source of water because I have to have a way to cool that process down and modulate the heat. And so they extract a lot of water. And if they don't um, cool that water back down, remember that can be put back into the environment and lead to thermal pollution. And there's that coal ash, the last part of the coal um, fuel cycle that is hazardous waste because of heavy metals that are left in there that needs to be properly disposed of. They're talking about disposal in an ash pond. And one of the solutions that we learn about in waste management is making sure that those ponds have liners on them. It's not that we can't um, regulate and sort of take care of the waste from this process as we transition away from using coal to make sure that we minimize the environmental and human health impacts. Nuclear is also a non-renewable resource. Nuclear power is generated by splitting or fissioning atoms of uranium-235. It's non-renewable because I have to mine that metal from the Earth's crust, just like I would mine copper or aluminum. And I have all of the same habitat loss issues associated with mining. In the process of generating electricity from nuclear power, when I split or fission that atom and start a chain reaction, a little bit of mass is converted into energy. And since there's a ridiculous number of uranium atoms that are being split, I generate a lot of power. 
And from here on out, this nuclear power plant looks just like that coal plant. The only difference is no combustion. Instead of burning coal to heat water to make steam to turn a turbine, I'm splitting atoms to heat water to turn a turbine to power a generator and push that electricity out to the grid. One of the main advantages of nuclear, no combustion. No combustion, no emissions, in the direct generating of electricity. Certainly in the construction of the nuclear power plant, there is a lot of cement that um, gener creating cement gen generates a lot of CO2 emissions. I had to transport um, materials to that job site. So um, mining the uranium, but in the direct generating of electricity, there is no emissions. Let's take a look at a couple example problems. Here's a multiple choice example. Stop and read the question and see if you can pick the right answer. Remember the graph that we just looked at, the three sources of, um, of energy that supply the majority of commercial energy in the world today, remember that graph, are coal, oil, and natural gas. But we're seeing an uptick in the renewables. Here's another multiple choice. Which of the following describes an advantage of natural gas over coal for generating electricity? If you guess letter D, you're, you're right. One of the things my students often ask is, I don't understand when I look at a combustion reaction, where's the sulfur when I burn coal? That sulfur is an impurity and we don't really represent it in the reaction of the combustion of the hydrocarbon, but the processes that form those fossil fuels and deposited that coal or oil, there's just tends to be a lot of sulfur and heavy metals that stick um, to the rock in those areas so that when I it, it's okay when they're buried underground, but when I dig it up and expose them and combust it or oxidize it, that's when all those, um, the compounds like sulfur and the mercury are released into the environment. So remember that even though natural gas is a gas that's cleaner than coal, it's still burned. I still have to put it in a combustion reaction and it still releases CO2. Let's take a look at an example free response question. Many energy analysts make the claim that nuclear energy is a cleaner, more sustainable form of energy than fossil fuels. Remember, we practiced this make a claim and justify a claim in our last video. Pause the video and see if you can justify that claim and support it with evidence. Perhaps you chose to accept that claim because generating electricity from nuclear fission does not produce direct emissions, such as carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas. Let's break down what I did to earn the point for this response. Remember, there's two things or two parts that I have to answer to this question in order to earn the point. I first have to come out and say if I accept or reject that claim, and then I have to support it with evidence. There's no um, direct data that I'm using for evidence here, so the evidence is my prior knowledge. And re realize that I had to go full circle in my explanation of my evidence in order to support the claim that it's more sustainable. It doesn't release carbon dioxide, and I didn't stop there. I mentioned that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, which implies that I know that it's trapping heat. I could also have rejected the claim first half of it, and my evidence is because generating electricity from nuclear fission produces radioactive hazardous waste, and that waste has to be stored for long periods of time. Here's another sample free response question where we're going to work um, a half-life problem. A soil sample near Chernobyl was found to contain 187 some random unit that you may not recognize, but don't let that unit like Get, get in your way, because it's really not all that relevant to the problem. It's simply a unit for measuring the amount of radioactivity. It's a kilobacterel um, named after the scientist Baccarel, who you may, be, may remember from chemistry class. Um, sometimes you might see a curie as a unit of um, radiation exposure. So we know that we're given the half-life of cesium. 
And we know that it's approximately 30, 30 years. So I want to know how much of the cesium-137 will remain in the sample after 90 years. If you're not sure how to get started on this problem, here's a little bit of a hint. The first thing you want to do is figure out how many half-lives have elapsed. The, I want to know how much remains after 90 years. Well, if each half-life is 30 years, then three half-lives have elapsed. Maybe that's enough of a little trick to get you going. So if I start with 187 kilobacarels, units of radioactivity, after one half-life, half of those atoms are still radioactive. After another half-life, I half it again. And after a third half-life, I'm left with 23.88 kilobacarels. I always tell my students to write this out and not do it in their head because it'd be pretty easy to mistakenly count this as one, two, three, the fourth half-life. And remember, one half-life ha is a, the process of having it. So there's a pretty good chance that you'll see a half-life calculation in a multiple choice or a free response. Let's take a look at a review problem um, and shift to renewable energy. We're going to go through a few different forms of renewable energy and look at the positives, the pros, and the cons, the negatives. The first is biomass. Remember, we mentioned that biomass is a major fuel source in developing countries because it could be burning trees or even animal dung. And the thing, one of the real positives about biomass, first of all, it's renewable. I can replace it if I'm harvesting my trees sustainably, it doesn't introduce new carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We're gonna come back and look at that in a minute, but it could lead to deforestation. And in fact, it is one of the leading causes of deforestation in the developing world. Solar energy tends to get a little confusing because I can do a lot of different things with solar energy, but in terms of generating electricity, those photovoltaic cells that we use, those PV cells, remember they generate electricity directly. So the sun, while some regions of the country or the world have greater solar potential than others, um, there's just a lot of promise with small scale solar photovoltaics. Um, there's that disadvantage, which as we look at some of the disadvantages of other fuel sources, lack of available sunlight doesn't tend to be a really big deal. One of the things that we often talk about related to that is the lack of battery storage. So if we could store that sunlight in a battery, we can kind of eliminate that no electricity when the sun doesn't shine. So that's where you students come in. You've got to develop bigger, better batteries so that we can store a lot of solar and wind power. Wind is the next one that we're going to look at. This is really great because think about all of the steps that we use to generate electricity from burning coal. The, the wind turbine is spinning that turbine right away. I eliminate all of the mining of a resource, although I do, still have to mine metals to make the turbine blades, but I'm spinning that turn up turbine directly and there's no combustion. Um, there are negatives associated with any way that we generate electricity. And for wind, we often focus on um, how bird or bat populations may be impacted. That's often an easy solution by not siting big wind turbines in the migratory path of birds. And finally, another renewable resource is geothermal. Geothermal, remember, is one of those forms of energy that can't be indirectly or directly related back to solar. It's generated from Earth's interior heat. And so it's really just tapping that natural heat from natural radioactive decay of elements. So I can just use that heat to make steam to turn a turbine and there's no combustion. It can, however, release hydrogen sulfide gas. Let's come back to this idea about carbon or biomass and that idea of no additional or no new carbon dioxide added to the atmosphere. The processes that created um, fossil fuels is if we think back to photosynthesis, plants took carbon out of the atmosphere and turned it into a sugar. And then when those plants died, all of that 
carbon that was in them over hundreds of millions of years and the right geologic conditions of, of time and heat and pressure took all that carbon and made that fossil fuel. It's an old plant that lived millions of years ago, hundreds of millions of years ago. And remember, in my basic combustion equation, I'm harvesting that and burning it and releasing CO2. And that is CO2 that would have been sequestered underground. It wouldn't actively be part of the carbon cycle. It probably would be there for another 300 million years. However, when I burn biomass, um, in the United States, a lot of our biomass comes from corn. We take the sugars in the corn, we turn it into an ethanol and alcohol, and we add that alcohol, that ethanol, we supplement our fossil fuel gas. I, the last time I bought gas, it was 10% ethanol. So think about it for a minute. If I'm burning biomass fuel, ethanol that just came from corn, that corn plant took carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and turned it into sugar. Six months ago, I harvested that corn and burned it as ethanol and the same atom of carbon dioxide, the same molecule of carbon dioxide that that plant recently took out and converted to a sugar in photosynthesis, I just put that same molecule of CO2 back in. That's where it gets at this idea of carbon neutral. Take carbon out during photosynthesis, turn that plant into, an, an, into a fuel and put the same CO2 back in rather than adding CO2 that has been sequestered and wouldn't be part of the carbon cycle. Big idea. Um, so next, let's move into energy conservation or some of the solutions that we want to focus on. You have to be careful when you read free response questions because they may focus on what a homeowner could do versus what industry could do. So um, methods to reduce energy use at home, this is kind of the low hanging fruit point. We expect every student in APES to be able to describe a simple strategy they could do to conserve energy. Adjusting the thermostat, keep it a little bit lower in the winter or a little bit higher in the summer when I'm air conditioning. I can um, purchase appliances that are ranked as being energy efficient. There's a, a labeling system called an energy star system. So I can look for those. I can use conservation landscaping. That conservation landscaping cools the surrounding area. Um, and that's, that can be used on a large scale in green building design as well. Um, I, those that conservation landscaping or the green roofs provide shade, which cools, they provide evaporative cooling because of the transpiration, um, the evapotranspiration off the surface of those plants. Um, here's some other larger scale things um, that we can do as well. Um, and always think about passive solar energy. If I hang my clothes out on a clothesline, I'm using passive solar energy. Another sort of tricky thing when we provide those solutions is instead of saying use um, an efficient light bulb, you have to make sure you say replace your inefficient light bulb with a more efficient light bulb. See the difference between saying use an efficient light bulb and replacing an efficient light bulb. I really need to imply that I'm getting rid of the old and efficient one and putting in one that's more efficient. A couple other things we can do, and we mentioned this early on, is that government policy has a lot to do with um, what type of fuel we use and how much it costs. So an individual leader of a country does not determine the price of gasoline. Gasoline was made from crude oil, which is a product that's traded on a global market. Everybody that buys crude oil pays the same amount of money for per barrel of crude oil. What different countries or states can do is tax the use of that at different rates. So they can offer a disincentive. They can discourage people from buying cars that have low fuel efficiency. They can encourage people to carpool by setting a higher tax on gas and then incentivizing people to conserve it and use less of it. Um, they can legislate to pass funding for the development of electrical vehicle charging station, stations, or they can pass legislation 
to develop special carpool lanes on the interstate that people don't maybe pay a toll or that they can get through much faster or providing carpool parking lots so that people all get in one car and drive into the city together. They can legislate um, average fuel standards that companies need to met, meet. Um, they can choose how they subsidize different energy industries. So we have to be a little bit careful when we talk about solutions and say the government can lower or raise the price of gasoline. They can tax the gasoline to change the price of it. Let's take a look at a practice and we're gonna go through sort of half of a calculation free response question that has four parts to it. What you're gonna do, we'll kind of go through the question together. You're gonna to wanna to get your calculator and paper and you're gonna to wanna to try and practice this just like you would if it were in a testing setting. Um, and then we'll go through the answers together. So in this example, a homeowner is looking for ways to increase electrical efficiency. They took our idea and decided to replace their inefficient incandescent bulbs with LED light bulbs to reduce their consumption. Now they're going to give us some data. And remember, we want to write and organize this data out on our paper. I'll model that when we go through it. Each bulb gives the same light output. So remember that in energy conversion processes, we don't always have the efficiency of the light bulb is how well it takes that electrical energy and converts it to light energy. So we measured the light bulbs and they each give out the same light output, yet the incandescent bulb uses 73 watts and the LED bulb uses only 9.9. .9. Each bulb is used for eight hours per day you have to calculate the amount of energy each bulb uses in kilowatt hours per day. Um, if the electricity costs 10.42 cents per kilowatt hour, calculate the savings they would realize in dollars per year, make a claim about which bulb is most efficient, and explain why one light bulb is more efficient than the other. So go ahead and pause the video. And we'll see you back here in a little bit to go through the answers. Let's see how you did on the calculation first. Calculate the amount of energy each bulb uses in kilowatt hours per year. Let's take a look at an energy calculation problem in which we're being asked to calculate the number of kilowatt hours per year used by two different kinds of light bulb, an incandescent and an LED. Remember, it's a good idea to start a calculation problem by writing down the final unit that you want the answer to be in, because the problem is always going to tell you that, and organizing all of the information that's given to you in the problem. Let's lay it out so that when it comes time to actually organize and set up the calculation, I've got all that information right at hand. I know that the incandescent bulb uses 73 watts and the LED bulb uses 9.9 .9 watts. This gets at the idea of energy efficiency because they each put out the same amount of light, but obviously use very different amounts of energy. I know that the um, problem tells me that each bulb is used for eight hours every day. So let's take a step back and look at our final unit again and the units that we have so far that are given to us. There, I've got this unit in an energy calculation called a kilowatt. I have to just know that that kilo prefix in the metric system represents 1,000. So I know that there are 1,000 watts in one kilowatt. And I know that I want to calculate the amount of energy per year. Well, I also know that there are 365 days in one year. Notice that taking just that little bit of extra time to organize all that information is really going to allow me to put that all together and get a better chance at correctly calculating it. So let's start off with the amount of watts that each bulb uses. The incandescent bulb uses 73 watts. I can convert from watts to kilowatts and it's easy for me to pull that out. Notice I put watts on the top here. It doesn't matter as long as I get the right number with the right unit. There are 1,000 watts in one kilowatt. Now, the interesting thing about the kilowatt hour calculation is that a kilowatt hour 
is kilowatts times hours. Nothing actually cancels to get that unit. So I can go ahead and put my hours in here right, right away. That bulb is used eight hours per one day. And I also have my last, that, my conversion factor right there. And I know that days is on the bottom here. So days is going to go on the top. There are 365 days in one year. Let's see how the units cancel. I can cancel my watt unit. I can cancel my day unit. Remember that a kilowatt hour is kilowatts times hours. So I'm going to end up with, once I do the calculation, 213.26, or I could round that to 213.3 kilowatt hours per year. All of those units are taken right from my setup. Remember that in order to earn a two full points on this, I have to have a setup with all the units in the setup and the correct answer calculated. Let's try the LED bulb. The LED bulb, my setup's gonna be the same. The only thing that's gonna change is the number of watts that it uses. There is still 1,000 watts in one kilowatt. The bulb is still used for eight hours every day. There is still 365 days in one year. I can cancel my units and it works out to kilowatt hours per year. Notice the difference in energy consumption, however. The LED bulb uses 28.9 kilowatt hours per year. Let's take a look at the next part of the calculation. Now that we know the amount of energy consumed by each of the different light bulbs in kilowatt hours per year, we want to calculate how much the homeowner spends to power each of those bulbs. Their rate of electricity use, or the rate that they pay for their electricity use, is 10.42 cents per one kilowatt hour. And there's two different ways that you can work with that sense value, um, we know that there's a hundred cents in a dollar. So I can do one of two different things. I can go ahead and put that, that one kilowatt hours on the top here for my incandescent bulb. And I know that one kilowatt hour is 10.42 cents. And I know that there is 100 cents in one dollar. So I can go ahead and do the calculation that way and I come up with $22.22 per one year. Notice that I can still cancel my units and end up with dollars per year. When I look at the LED bulb, let's see another different way that I could do that calculation. Maybe in my head, I can shimmy that decimal point over and convert that directly to a dollar. So I could say that one kilowatt hour is $0.1042. Here, I go, went ahead and added that extra conversion right into my problem, converting from cents to dollars, or I can do that simple conversion in my head and I still will end up with dollars per year. And the LED bulb saves us not only a lot of energy, but a lot of money. Um, and so it costs $3.01 per year, whereas the incandescent bulb is $22.22 .22 per year. Here's the rest of the FRQ, um, where we get some practice making a claim about energy efficiency. Here, we only have one claim that we can make. We're based on, remember that that claim is based on evidence or data, um, and we have the, or knowledge or evidence, and we have the direct evidence from our data to support only one claim, that the LED bulb is more efficient and it's more efficient because it produces the same light output using less energy. 
explain why one light bulb is more efficient than other. Remember in the explain why I'm going to say because something happens. The LED bulb is more efficient at converting electrical energy to light energy because less energy is converted into low quality heat. That should kind of sound familiar to you if you think back to a previous unit where we talked about the loss of energy that occurs when we move from one trophic level to another, that 10% ecological efficiency, the second law of thermodynamics, that same law applies to this situation. Let's take a look at another free response example, and we'll go through the solutions. In this example, we're going to use even bigger amounts of energy. We're looking at an offshore wind project, farm project, uses turbines to generate electricity, and it's proposed to be built along the Atlantic coast of the U.S. to replace a coal-powered plant. It will be located 13 kilometers from the coast in water at an average depth of 10 meters. A is to describe an environmental benefit associated with an offshore wind project. B, describe an unintended consequence of the offshore wind project. The next part then is going to have the calculations. The electrical demand in the area to be served by the project is expected to be two times 10 to the sixth megawatt hours per year. Hmm, not a kilowatt hour, but a megawatt hour. The next prompt, letter C, asks me to calculate how much electricity in megawatt hours per year the wind project needs to generate in order to provide 80% of the annual electrical demand in the service area. And we know how much their demand is going to be. This question is saying we only, the, the plant, the wind shore farm is not going to totally replace the coal plant's power, but their goal is to provide 80% of the demand. And finally, customers in the service watt area pay $0.2 per kilowatt hour, calculate how much revenue will be produced if the wind turbines produce 80% of the electrical demand. Good luck with this one, and I'll see you in a minute to work through the calculations. I think I have a hint for you here before you get started. Let's take a look at that megawatt unit to make sure you're clear of how you're gonna put that in. Just like we need to know that that metric prefix kilo always means 1000 of a base unit, I have to know that that prefix mega means a million of a base unit. So to go from the base unit, a watt, to a kilowatt is a thousand, from a base unit, a watt, to a megawatt is a million, but to go from a kilo to a mega is 1,000. There are 1,000 times 1,000 will get me to that megawatt. Good luck with that calculation. Let's look at the response to the two introductory questions where I'm asked to describe an environmental benefit of an offshore wind farm. There will be less coal burned, which will reduce the habitat destruction associated with coal mining and the emission of carbon dioxide and SOx. Um, any of those, I only had to have one benefit, so any of those responses would be appropriate. Describe an unintended consequence. Remember, there's a couple of different things that you could talk to uh, or could talk about. The wind farm would result in habitat fragmentation, potentially um, causing a decline in their population of the fish because it's offshore, or the wind farm could pose a threat to birds or bats that fly into the spinning turbines. Let's take a look at the solutions to the calculation. Let's try another sample energy calculation. As usual, we want to begin with the information that's given to us in the problem. In this case, what they're telling us is that the expected demand for the community that's proposing the wind project is going to be two times 10 to the sixth megawatt hours per year. In letter C, they're asking us to calculate how much electricity in megawatt hours per year the wind project needs to generate to fulfill 80% of the community's demand. In other words, the wind turbine isn't going to be able to provide all of their electricity, but it will be able to provide 80%. And I can think of 80% as 80 out of 100, which is the same as 0.8. 
So if it's going to provide 80% of their demand, I just have to take 80% of that value. So 0.8 times 2 times 10 to the 6th megawatt hours, technically that's per year, comes out to 1.6 times 10 to the 6th megawatt hours per year. That's how much electricity the wind project needs to generate to fulfill 80% of their proposed demand. Letter D is asking me to calculate how much revenue will be produced. So my final unit is going to be dollars. They want me to calculate how much revenue is produced if the turbines provide 80% of that energy. That's already been taken into account in the previous question, but they give me another they tell me that this community is currently paying. Notice that they've already represented the amount that they're paying in dollars, not cents. They pay $0.2 per one kilowatt hour. And remember how important it is to represent that value as a ratio and pull that out from how it's written in the text. So here's a really important thing that we wanna take into consideration when we look at calculation-based questions. I may have gotten this answer wrong. I may not have come up with the correct value for that, but I have to use that value in this next question. So it doesn't matter what value I got for letter C, what the reader's going to look for is that I recognized that I had to start with the amount of electricity that the wind project could actually produce for the community, how much of their demand it could produce, and then f figure out um, the amount of revenue that will be produced. So I'm going to start with my 1.6 times 10 to the sixth megawatt hours per year. And I'm, my first conversion is going to have to be from megawatts or megawatt hours to kilowatt hours. And that prefix mega refers to one to the sixth or 1,000 kilowatt hours. So there are 1,000 kilowatt hours in one megawatt hour. One kilowatt hour costs $0.20. And I can cancel my units. Megawatt hours cancel and kilowatt hours cancel and I end up with dollars per year. And the number's gonna kind of surprise you. I'm gonna scoot it over here to the side. You should have ended up with 3.2 times 10 to the eighth dollars or $320 million. Woohoo! that's a lot of revenue. We just have so much fun with those calculation problems. I hope you guys are figuring out um, some strategies for attacking them. Let's um, take a look at what we should take away from this review session video. Here are the big ideas. You should be able to identify examples of renewable and non-renewable resources, describe what makes a resource renewable or non-renewable, explain how electricity is generated from various energy resources, calculate energy consumption and cost savings, and justify solutions by describing advantages, disadvantages, and unintended consequences. Thanks so much for joining me. We'll see you next time.